um, welcoming all the, our guests today. And today we're going to be discussing, we're going to be talking with one uh, very important topic, which is the digital transformation of art. Nothing more, nothing less. Um, there's a we are wondering about what's the future of for art. I'm sorry, I'm going to disappoint you. We're not going to give you a straight answer. This is the first thing that our friend Harald Klenk has uh, told us today. I, I am very grateful for his presence here today and also to the embassy, uh, German embassy, who has uh, organized this event together with uh, Espacio Fundación Telefónica. I would also like to thank Javier Navarro from the Colección Solo both of them are very capable of providing us an answer, maybe not regarding the future of art, but rather focusing our questions regarding this topic. Uh, today, Harald uh, is a historian of digital art or digital uh, historian, uh, digital art historian. He was mentioning the fact that he was uh, trained and ed educated in one of the pioneering centers who started uh, studying the intervention of technology in art it's a reference uh, it's a place of reference he was asking me if I had ever been there and I have never been uh, lucky enough to be there but it's definitely it's one of our sources for our research and consultation when I have to tackle any topic related to uh, um, current art, art and uh, in particular digital art. This is a center that is focusing in uh, transmedia and uh, technological art. He was, uh, he learned when in connection with painters and smelling the oils and the pigments made him feel at home. These are the type of contradictions of our digital area where everything is coexisting and nothing replaces what was before. Everything is fed with what was there before and we're generating new dialogues so that the new media, those who already exist, such as the painting, uh, are much richer. This is something that Javier Navarro knows very well and um, in the collection solo that he hosts uh, they have from NFTs intangible uh, objects and also oil paintings among other uh, works of art and I hope that Harald will have the opportunity of visiting it too. Today we're going to talk about um, uh, AI or machine learning. A few years back, people said that uh, human creativity cannot be replaced by a robot. There's no chance we can create a creative technology, but it seems like we're there. Uh, or at least we have reached the point in which we start wondering if those artificial intelligences can be independent from their developers. Um, from those who created them in the very beginning and these are things that we are going to deal with today and somehow these new technologies are uh, challenging our own um, idea of the artist of what creativity is of what imagination is and when we talk about imagination I think this is the thing that we're going to tackle today the difference between uh, the image and the imagination um, uh, Klinke, Mr. Klinke has insisted on, on the fact that he is a historian in digital visual culture within this line of cultural studies uh, within the Anglo-Saxon school we have to understand where all the images that we are creating come from or the images that are created by machines who are similar to us uh, come from and also in what way they're going to add to the dynamic of the images in the future and when these images are over flooding us when there's an maybe a hyper um, uh, exposure of all these images. E each of us has a device that is capable of creating new images and we find the debate of what entity or what category do these images have? Can they be considered art? Will there be a file uh, that can be used by a future artist or will they be processed by programs such as DALI to create creative images that can compete with human artists? These are things that we can also um, 
ask about, to question about. We're talking about utopias and utopias and worlds that we cannot even imagine nowadays, but we have the strong feeling that the future is now. So thank you very much, uh, Harald Klinke, for being here today. I will read some lines about his biography. He's a um, professor uh, of uh, digital arts. So he studied philosophy, art, um, in Berlin, Norwich, among other places. Uh, he had his PhD in Germany. Um, from 2008 to 2009, he worked as a professor of visual studies, where he also developed the visual alphabetization. Um, and um, I want to ask him a few questions about this. He also started several uh, researches and he was a fellow student in Columbia, in the University of Columbia, New York. He's also a member of the committee of uh, the digital image. In 2021, he finished his studies in Munich with the thesis um, of uh, application systems based on images for the uh, studies of art and history. Uh, it's very interesting to highlight that he's currently studying how to use all these technologies, not to only to the generation of visual arts or images, but also to the studies itself, study itself. So to what extent we can use the algorithm to understand better the visual environment in which we find ourselves. Without further ado, I want to welcome him on the stage and thank you for the organizers of this event. The floor is yours. Good evening. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Good. Good evening, everyone, and thank you very much for this kind introduction. Um, um, as uh, you just mentioned, I'm an art historian and I'm a digital art historian. That means we are using digital means, digital methods to understand the history of art better. But uh, we all not only call it the digital art history, but also the digital art history, because both belongs together. The current developments in art have always spurred the developments of methods in our field art history. So thank you very much also the Espacio Fundación Telefónica for hosting me today and the German Embassy for the kind invitation. I would like to talk about uh, the digital transformation of the art world within 20 to 30 minutes, um, um, that which is of course a broad uh, field and I would l rather focus on how does the art world currently transform and what is AI art and how much does it possibly threaten human creativity and imagination. I have three chapters, this is the first one. We're living in a time of digital transformation. That means the world is always transforming and today the digital technology is probably uh, the gr biggest, uh, the strongest force of, the, of a transformation. And the di digital transformation in various fields usually takes place in several quite similar phases. The first such, such phase is the digitization of media. That means we've had analog media before today we have digital media and we can use or look at those media as digital data that we can analyze and that uh, gives rise to new digital methods because we are analyzing that data and we can rearrange certain work processes and roles for example within companies. And the third one is within companies we can invent new business models, we can in the end uh, have a new idea of how what our, our organization actually is. And that tr digital transformation you see in many areas, one is communication, of course we don't write letters anymore, at least not that many anymore. We're using instant messaging apps to communicate Transportation is one thing. We came by an Uber. You s step on the street and you call an, a, a car and you are will be driven to a certain place, for example. 
research. Imagine, for example, astronomers who are not looking through certain kinds of telescopes anymore. So they're looking on d screens because the telescopes are somehow automated and they gather data, big, d big data from astronomy and, only, and the researcher only looks at those images in case something is unforeseen. GLAM is galleries, libraries, archives and museums. Uh, this is the field of culture uh, where I'm rather from that shows you that uh, museums are now building data infrastructures in order to better communicate their objects of art into a virtual space, for example. Or government, for example, munici municipalities become data-driven organizations more and more also in order to service, to do a better service to their citizens in that uh, in that city for example and many other many other fields you can you can tell yourself and one of those fields might be art how is art transforming due to digital technology G -G, due to um, new media so to speak the first note is this is not the first transformation of art of course the digital transformation is just one transformation of the art world in a series for example um, remember the important revolution of artistic media photography following the year 1837 in the invention of daguerre and fox talbot Photography has been an artistic tool for a certain time before it became an artistic medium itself. Portrait pho photo uh, portrait photography, for example, has swept aside miniature paintings. Miniature po uh, uh, paintings, portrait paintings, has been replaced by portrait photography. And photography's factual representation has probably probably been one reason of painting going abstract. Photography has found its place in the ecosystem of artistic media and has transformed the creative process. So what then is the digital transformation of art that we want to talk about? Well, of course, it starts with the digitization of the medium. For example, we are using digital photography today instead of analog photography. We are using tools of creation such as Photoshop. We have to admit the fact that we are increasingly um, producing images as digital born that are not digitized from an analog medium. The second element is we have an infrastructure for dissemin dissemination such as the web, social media, NFTs. Um, it it, it, the new structure for dissemination is how we distribute and discover objects of art and art and any kind of images. These structures, the structures of those platforms also structure our discourse, how we, how we uh, take part in that discourse, how we uh, comment about artworks and so on. And in the end, it leads to a flood of images, and that flood of images can only be um, explored by the help of algorithms. You cannot, um, you cannot cope with that big image data without the use of computers them themselves. That means the fact uh, that our media are digital opens up for its data analysis and uh, is by the way helpful for art history what we call digital art history for example we have those dimensionality reduction algorithms that allow us to get an overview over a large corpus of what we call digital uh, what we call big image data that allows us to see a whole corpus of objects from afar. We call that distant viewing in relation to distant reading in uh, literature studies. And we are increasingly using machine learning and what's called artificial intelligence also for our, for our end, for our, for our means. And um, the medium going digital allows advanced processes. L let me give you a few example, examples. In the year, year 2015, a group of scientists from Tübingen in Germany, from the university there, said, look, if you have a photo, for example, of the beautiful Tübingen, and another image, for example, of uh, by Van Gogh, the starry night, you can train a net neural network and uh, take a certain layer from that neural network that represents style. And you can apply the style from one 
image to another image and, trans and, 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 and transfer the style from one image to another and make the photo appear as if it were from the in the style of um, Van Gogh in this case. And of course, you can do this with any other style and apply that to a photo that then appears in a certain style. And that is one step that we can mimic certain styles in that digital medium. And since it's digital, we can also take apart a video, which is just a sequence of image, images, and apply a certain style to it and have a kind of impressionist video, which wouldn't be possible in the analog medium of painting, of course. Um, then, a few uh, around the same time, generative adversarial networks, GANs, were invented. This algorithm consists of two parts, the generator and the discriminator. So you can imagine you have very many images of real faces and you uh, train a discriminator to understand which is an actual face and which isn't. So there's a decision whether, whether it's true, real or fake, whether it is a face or it's not. And a generator is another neural network that creates images, at first just random noise, but it gets a feedback from the discriminator whether it has been a face or not. And so the generator can learn more and more what actually is um, a face in this case. So if you have a set of, let's say, um, numbers, uh, written, handwritten numbers, you can train such a GAN to create new numbers. If you have a large set of uh, faces, you can make it generate images that look like faces or animals or landscapes, you name it. And since that was published in 2014, just um, a few years later, um, a collective of artists created um, a painting or, a, or an object of art in with a gun, so an object of art that has represents no real person but was created by a neural network and sold this at Christie's auction in the year 2018 for 432 $1,500, probably since it was the first of this kind of image in the realm of art that was then sold. Just uh, around that time, NVIDIA improved that algorithm and made it available to the public via a website and you can create high quality images of uh, faces on that website, for example this one or that one or this one, and none of these faces represent a real person. Because you're using that GAN to create an image that the discriminator understands is a face. And like this, you can uh, generate as many faces as you wish that represent no real person. And for that reason, you can try this for yourself. If you go on the website, this person does not exist, and you can generate your own faces. That looks a little bit like magic, but behind that is just a certain software model that generates images that look like something, in this case, uh, faces. There are different models, different uh, combinations of neural networks and so on, but we can imagine there are a lot of input images, you need to have a lot of data to create that. They're kind of abstracted, similar to, by the way, how uh, our, our sight is uh, brought to our visual cortex on our brain. And um, that is a certain layers of abstraction that are then stored in that model in the latent space representation that is a neural network uh, trained with many images and their characteristics are kind of abstracted, one could say compressed or encoded. The representation, representation in the latent space refers to a totality of images without being an image or visual itself. And the interesting thing about this is that this reduction can be reversed, kind of decompressed or decoded in order to generate further images that were not previously in the input. In that latent space of that abstract representation of that totality of input images, you can then kind of 
point at certain uh, places and generate images from there and do variations from that. Um, and in that space of possibilities, uh, um, you can kind of fish in that pool, in that pond, uh, and, 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 and pull out new uh, images. Next in uh, that uh, history is the year 2021, when the CLIP algorithm was um, introduced. That's called Contrastive Language Image Pre-Training. This is a neural network that's trained on a variety of image and text pairs. That means this CLIP algorithm can create a vector space whose dimensions represent both features of images and features of ang language. So we have those images and we cannot only get certain tags or terms. It seems as if it describes the image as if it understands what's on the image. So it seems like it's not only a translation but if, as if it, un it understands certain concepts. So it's a multi-modal connection between images and texts and this is what we call a transformer model. And now imagine we're not turning images into text, but we're turning text into images. And here comes Delhi that's creating images from text. It is somewhat complicated, but we can imagine it like this. We have a prompt, an image, a uh, text input, where we explain something, so the other way around compared to clip. It will be encoded into a kind of latent space and we have a certain different latent space where the images are and we uh, bring that into parallel and from there we can then again generate something, uh, something visual from there. And the most um, famous and one of the first such transformer models from text to image is DALI 2. DALI 2 is a neural network developed by OpenAI that can create images from text descriptions. And OpenAI is engaged in research into artificial intelligence with the aim of developing open source artificial intelligence in a way that, at least according to their own statements, does not harm society. So somewhat strange that it's financed by Microsoft and Elon Musk, but that's set aside. The word Delhi is a combination of the name of the robot in the movie Wall-E and the name of the Spanish artist Salvador Dali, of course. In order to be able to generate images, the model was trained using millions of images available on the, on the web, on the internet. And the first uh, version was introduced in 2021 and the second one in April this year. So how does that transformer model actually work? Well, in the beginning, you have a prompt, a text input. And I've just used uh, the title of this talk today and used that as a prompt. And it generates images from that. Maybe that's not a very good example because it's a rather abstract prompt and you get rather abstract images. And artificial intelligence obviously has to do with somehow a human uh, a skull and uh, maybe an eye and some abstract uh, patterns around that. This is how that, uh, a uh, that AI model imagines uh, that text input. What you can do is you can choose one. I've, cho I've chosen the second one and ask it for variations. And what you see here, it moves a little bit around in that latent space and looks for other um, possible images um, that can be generated from that, that in content that is from the descriptions are the same but have different representations. What, you are, what else you can do is what's called in-painting, that is you erase certain elements from that image and you describe in that prompt what you would like the, 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 the complete image to represent. I've added taking place in Madrid and what you can see here are uh, uh, four different iterations. What you can see here, the right part stays the same and on the left part what I've erased, something else has been inserted. It's not a good example because nothing resembles uh, anything like uh, Madrid in this case, uh, but um, it's still it still shows that it preserves the content and it preserves the style that is somehow a plausible image in altogether. 
You can also upload your own images. I've taken the Hunters in the Snow by Bruegel and just uploaded that and asked it to generate certain variations. And this is what it gave me in return. All those four variations look very much like Bruegel. Of course, the computer doesn't know that there are hunters, it doesn't know that there is snow or, or dogs. But from its experience, from its visual experience, from millions of images from the web, it can recreate so something similar to the input image. And it looks very plausible, surprisingly, almost uh, magical, because it could be a Bruegel, at least in that uh, digital representation. There's also a feature that's called outpainting, so it can imagine something beyond our canvas, and if you create that, you get a few more birds, a few more snow, a little bit more snow. You can enlarge it, in, uh, enlarge it in that direction, and you can see that even the landscape in the background has been um, created from the input image. And that image, uh, if we look at it, is somehow plausible because you still have those kind of skaters there, you still have that uh, snow landscape, uh, the uh, mountain in the background has turned into a kind of castle, you have shadows there that look a little bit like the birds that we have in the input image and all together it looks a bit surreal but at, at first sight it looks somewhat natural somehow. It looks like the input image. And the allega allegation here is that some people say, what if AI now takes over art? Because it looks like an artwork, of course. So we could say everyone's an artist, just like Joseph Beuys said, because everyone is, has access to the service of uh, Delhi uh, at OpenAI, and you'd only need a prompt, and something is created that looks like an artwork. And some say, this is the end of creativity, uh, because we have handed all, everything over to AI. But I say it's the beginning. It's the beginning of maybe a new creativity. It might be the catalyst of a transformation. The internet is the biggest knowledge base we have ever created. You maybe remember Vannevar Bush, who in 1945 already uh, envisioned a machine where we can put in all our knowledge and, co uh, and uh, co uh, contribute to other people's knowledge. We remember Tim Berners-Lee, who has conceived the World Wide Web as we know it today. And the World Wide Web is not only textual knowledge that we can write and read, but also a repository of visual representation. And those AI models build on the huge data source of the web. But we, what we actually want is not, ha we don't want to have a repository of knowledge only. We actually want to go beyond showing what we already know. We want to create new knowledge, a better understanding of the world as scientists, as artists, as everyone, as, as citizens. We want to better understand the world. How does that work? Well, Plato said that all ideas uh, behind the visible wor world come from the topos hyperorianos, an over-heavenly place where our souls come from. According to him, understanding is just remembering those ideas. That means epistemology, then, is the process of getting back to those ideas. How does that work? Well, in his book... Of on human understanding, first published in 1690, John Locke states that we come to life with a mind that is tabula rasa. There's nothing on our, on, on, on our brain. There's nothing on it at first. And he writes, let us then suppose the mind to be, as we say, white paper, void of all characters, without any ideas. How come it to be furnished? To this answer in one word, from experience. So if they, we come to this earth with nothing in our mind. There's only one possibility something can be written on that piece of paper. It's via our sensual experience we can come to an understanding of the world via senses and thinking. Well, John Locke's idea of the mind is somewhat logocentric. Joshua Reynolds, the president of the Royal Acad Academy, doesn't compare the mind with a paper full of characters, but from his artist's pers perspective, 
as something like a blank canvas at first, and he follows Locke that humans have not direct access to the topos hyperoreanos, but we must study nature in order to get a higher idea. And he told his students in 1769, they can shortcut this, by this task by the study of old masters, because there we can already study ideal depictions. He said, it is indisputable evident that the great part of every man's life must be employed in collecting materials for the exercise of genius. Invention, strictly speaking, is little more than a new combination of those images which have been previously gathered and deposited in the memory. So we have visual experience and the visual experience we have in our kind of visual memory, we can recombine and then bring onto canvas and create new images. So we asked the students to create their own large mental image archive in order to vary these images as extensive as, extensive as possible. So what we want is understanding the world via visual experience, via images, and we could call this a visual epistemology. And what I show here now is a kind of simplified diagram how we can imagine that. So there's the world. We can never understand the world as it is. We can only observe it and make up our mind what the world actually is. We can create a kind of internal theory about the world of, you will, a model. And the interesting thing is that we as humans, we are cultural creatures. We can create something in order to communicate our internal theory about the world in artworks or more generally in image, images. And the German philosopher Ernst Cassirer once said, Called, called this process of creation, creating symbolic forms, or in general culture in the broadest sense, including artworks. The creation of music, fine arts, uh, even religion and so on, is a way of mentally bring in order the world and the resulting visual representation are a contribution to the visual discourse about the world that others then can see and take as a second basis of their own thinking. It's kind of a visual thinking that feeds back into a world of images uh, that we can then study. We can study nature and we can study what others have studied already. And this world of images today is online. And as I said, it's a repository we can use. If we um, train this world of online images to an AI model, we can use it to generate AI images. We should keep in mind at this place um, that if those AI models are run as businesses, such as OpenAI, um, that often that, that they are using, they are exploiting actually existing imagery from the web, often without the, the creator's consent. And this not actually happens automatically. Of course, there's certain input by the human, for example, in the input of the prompt, that might be a kind of a creative input. But in general, it builds upon the stock of images we have found on the web. And you can see uh, OpenAI, for example, encourages you to generate them and also show them to the world via social media. So what happens here is also a feedback loop into the uh, world of images online and future AI models will build on those objects that came from that model itself. So we should keep in mind that those models are also fed back into the system and the model has no direct access to the real world, world as we as humans have. Also keep in mind the so-called artificial intelligence can only interpolate within the latent space of existing image data. It is a simulation of intelligence and a simulation of invention. AI can emulate, it can create images that look like existing images, that look like what we, what we consider to be art from art history. Real creativity, we usually think, is more than that. So where do new ideas come from and what is imagination? 
If we follow John Locke and Joshua Reynolds, creativity is only a recombination of sensory impressions. And creativity in the sense of extrapolation means enlarging the latent space is what still only humans can do. Humans can see the world and come to new conclusions, new ideas, new ways of seeing. So we still need the human in the loop if we want to have progress. Only natural human intelligence can create new interesting content and new understanding of the world. An example I would like to show you that makes that more clear. In 2016, a group of researchers, again funded by Microsoft, um, scanned a number of paintings by um, uh, Rembrandt and applied certain analysis on it, then created a new Rembrandt, pr even printed that in 3D that resembles like an old painting, and then presented to the world something that very much resembles what we know of Rembrandt. And it looks like the following, something that looks like a painting and looks very much like a Rembrandt portrait. But it's nothing new. It is an interpolation of his paintings. What we expect from art today is, of course, avant-garde. Who could add to our understanding of our world today? Humans only, and humans that take today's technology as means for their symbolic forms. So the AI can write what sounds like something already written. It can create an image similar to images already created in convincing style that looks artistic, that is what has been art already. It can interpolate between billions of existing images. It can ex it cannot extrapolate, it cannot create something new. Hence, it looks like art and needs additional human thought and skill to become art. And then it will be a serious new medium in the ecosystem of, of, cre of, of creativity. Last chapter. If we are looking for something new, then we need to go with AI image generation in the direction of experimentation. Experimentation of how we can we use how we can we can use it as a tool for creativity, not as a replacement of creativity. Also let me quickly show you a few examples. And most of the examples I show are taken from Twitter actually. This one by Paul Trillio. Um, shows uh, development and evolution of nature from a water drop up to a bird and in reverse. And you can imagine how this was generated. He has taken apart his uh, video footage and fed in every image to Delhi. And he sh also shows that in this video and erased certain part of that leaf and told Delhi what he wants to see there and then recombined all those images again to a, to a video. Maybe m even more interesting is this one. It's not real. The jealousy matters. Nothing is real, but you see, it's not real. The jealousy matters. Nothing is real. That is created in the same style, but it's also interesting that here the question is being asked what is actually real and what, how can we take a video for granted. Adam Pickard uh, created, uh, used that outpainting feature in order to uh, restage that famous e Eames clip of uh, zooming out from uh, a group of people into space. So you see every prompt that he entered, and like this, you can create a, a video like this. Or something like that by Glenn Marshall, and you see videos like this uh, more and more in, on social media. Again, you see um, a sequence of images, so that what we call a video, with the same content, because it always has the same prompt, but in different variation, but in the same style, and the content seems to be croissant, marmalade, and, uh, and coffee maybe in Paris, or something like that. Like and of course, you probably 
know him, Mario Klingemann used a generative adversarial network to show portraits that are evolving and he asked you to sit in front of those screens and maybe reflect on what an image is, what a portrait is, what identity is and maybe who you self are. Or last example is Refik Anadol, who used 300 million photos of nature and did not try to create convincing photo-like images, but to capture the beauty of nature in its evolving abstraction, or as he calls it, hallucination. It's something between abstraction and the reference to an idea of nature. What we see here can be called an artistic research, maybe. That means experiments with image processing, with image data and algorithms, dealing with computer science methods, but in the context of an artistic appropriation. These are just a few examples, and I would like to close with the following what I think. AI art, I believe, will transform the niches of existing artistic media. Photography will change. Painting will change because there's a this, this new media on, on that stage that will also tackle the role of other media. It will transform the artistic process because we will put it into that process as one element of somehow an, uh, a companion to our own creativity and we can rearrange that process of creativity. It will transform the role of the artist because the artist maybe becomes more dem demo demo democratized, that more people can Im think of themselves as artists and show their works to the world. It will transform the idea of what an image is because we usually think of an image as a represent representation of something. Photography is a representation of the visual wor world, for example. And the AI-generated images are rather representations of uh, a number of images or a whole, a whole corpus of images. We still have to work on image theory here. And I believe it will transform the idea of art itself because art will be something else in the future, I believe. Most importantly, we will get used to AI images, to its aesthetics and that they exist. What is currently aesthetically new will appear conventional very quickly, we will see. And that is also an important part of the digital transformation. And lastly, to make this clear, I'm not saying every artist today should work digitally and use AI m methods as tools for their own image creation. I say this is currently the most innovative field in image making and art. Hence, it is most interesting for me as an art historian, since here new things take place and here I see this future of art and I believe we are still in its beginning. So thank you very much for listening. Muchas gracias. Eh, la verdad es que intuyo que, que esto es una... This is just a small fragment of what we could have seen. I suppose that some of th these things, you might have known them because lately we have seen a lot in the press. So DALI is uh, something that is starting to be, to be used. Uh, it's uh, like one of these toys that or these apps that we used to have that made you look older or younger and we used to play a lot with them. And uh, there are new models every day, more sophisticated, and they are into fearing or at least they're challenging us um, regarding the future of the creator the visual creators or the visual arts in the broader sense uh, considering that they are always incorporating their new technologies i want to introduce uh, to an end uh, have uh, javier navarro in uh, this debate he is a ba in um, journalism in the university complutense of madrid he has also a master in from the Instituto de Empresa and a um, degree by the INSEAD school. He has worked in different advertising agencies such as Wonderman Thompson and uh, he has also worked in Update and many other initiatives. I think this was started here and 
uh, another uh, dig and another project called the Digital Brain or Brainy. I think he can contribute a lot to this debate. He's also the strategy director of the Colección Solo, the art collection. If you have not seen it yet, I would uh, invite you to um, to ask for an appointment so you can be uh, you can visit it. Uh, there seems to be. Um, a lot of hunger for collections and there isn't enough space to uh, host all the uh, works by the artists uh, that are currently available. I am very interested in what you have to uh, give us today. Uh, I didn't know um, what glam meant. Uh, I just found out today and you are part of this glam world that uh, is surrounding in creation and you are supporting artists firsthand. This collection is not a passive entity but also supports from different uh, aspects from different angles such as production to different artists uh, among which is Mario Klingemann whom we have seen already in the presentation before my first question uh, to uh, pick on some of the questions that Harald mentioned is and I think that it's probably the main doubt that we might have uh, which is regarding the uh, possibility of intel uh, artificial intelligence not being able to create anything new but they will concoct or they will intercross uh, different existing elements and therefore creativity will be uh, sort of the result of an addition of uh, things an assembly so to speak but uh, I know that Javier and I we have talked about uh, certain artists that are treading into that realm where uh, although where they're questioning if artificial intelligence can really create art by itself and I'm very curious about your viewpoint on this um, and the artists in certain collectives that are also starting the research in this field do you think that artificial intelligence cannot create new art? It's a very good question thank you very much for the introduction congratulations on your presentation Harold um, our vision or point of view because we're speaking about different artists and Mario Klingemann uh, we work with him in our uh, support program and we work with other artists that are managing um, digital environments not all of them use AI Mar Mario does is an expert in AI and that's his mission I mean the mission the vision is that it's it's a tool that can help you bring your art to discover new boundaries. I mean, it can help you design new environments. It can help you bring your art expression further away. Um, I think that the artist's role has to be there. It's true that AI works with images, millions of images. Probably there's a bias because they are much older images, although there are millions of images. Maybe they are not data yet. Maybe there are other modern images that aren't there because of legal issues. So there is some kind of bias there. I think that the um, contribution of the artist is how to work with this in order to reach new boundaries. I think that it's not about revisiting historic um, works of art or historic artists um, but to discover new challenges or new ways of expression or to connect the AI world and digital art with sculptures for example with other kind of expressions we've seen that with video not only with uh, painting so I think that it is a tool I mean, if we ask Mario, maybe he would say, well, if, uh, we used to work with the brushes, I work with code. So uh, I work with AI tools, and that's their tool to express. But I don't think that it's going to replace um, the artist. So, we have seen several examples about the extent to which these um, dev devices can create images that are not strictly new because they're not opening new creative paths, they have a certain capacity of accessing this database 
uh, of um, the that a single person or even a collective of uh, a community of artists would not have access to one of the advantages uh, now is that we can have access to a, a huge brain so to what extent is creativity connected to the storage of visual references so a sort of ram memory so to speak one individual has a limited memory but if we have a big collective brain we encounter a lot of uh, visual references and this might bring about a potential creativity so what is your take Harold on about the amount of um, uh, or that these tools can create and if this is based on the massive amount of uh, references that they have if we if in imagination is not always considering different references in a brand and is there anything that we cannot replicate with this codes in your opinion <coughs> we're living in a world of big data today and we must get used to it mm. Big data means that um, we have access to information more than our human brain can actually process. In former times, you went to the library or to the gallery and you had a, a look at a certain uh, 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 parts of information. And today, we have access to lots of data that are generated and cre uh, or, or, um, generated and accessed. Uh, every second and living in a time of big data means for us that we can more easily navigate through um, um, congestion on, on the street for example because a lot of data are gathered and Google knows that um, there must be something in front of us so it gives us a, di a, a di diversion on the street for example so data is gathered and brought it to our to our advantage in certain ways and a lot of business models are based on that but living in a time of big data also has some um, um, so some um, uh, reflections in our day-to-day -day life and also in, in art. As you said, I totally agree that uh, such AI models are kind of um, search engine for images, a different kind of search engine than we know from Google Image Search, for example, where we enter a, a text and we get an actual image back. But it's a um, latent space representation of all images on the web. And we have an idea of an image and we are looking for it and it generates from that latent space. But of course, it can come to um, to ideas, so to speak, or to a, a visual representation that maybe we as individuals wouldn't have had uh, a, a, a similar idea of because it has seen more images that we could see and experience in a lifetime. Mm -hmm. So if we have access to such a powerful tool, how does it change our way of thinking about images and knowledge and information? <laughs> At first, it's a fantastic tool to give us access to something. But also, it shows us much more than we could ever think of. It shows us much more than um, we want to imagine, because maybe it has much less of a bias than we usually think, because it knows all uh, images on the web. You know? And what we do with the results from those models is, is, the, is the crucial point, that is, do we accept it as somehow as a new reality that the algorithm on the basis of um, big image data gives us? Or is it a part of our understanding of the world as it is today? And I believe the great artists such as Mario Klingemann use that technology in order to explain us, look, we are living in the world of big data, of big image data, mm -hmm. and the more we use it, the technology, in order to express that, mm -hmm. fa that, that fact, the more society tends to learn from it, understands it, accept um, that technology in our day-to-day -day life. Mm. And I believe art artists and artworks have an important role in that, in that digital transformation of our society to make that understandable and in the end maybe somewhat acceptable. Mm -hmm. I agree that, uh, with you and probably Javier 
uh, things in the same line that the contemporary art or that art that wants to create the avant-garde has the um, responsibility of representing its environment in a critical way or not in a mimetic way but also in order to create a certain reflection of on what's going on and the use of the tools with which we coexist and that also entails certain um, things. Uh, for instance, now we see there's a sort of a, a genre or a, a trend that is the surveillance art that uses the same devices that so uh, we are being controlled with um, in, in in a way all these sensors or all, all these mechanisms that actually um, put our individuality under surveillance or under control and they use this in order to uh, denounce these um, facts and they use it in, in the way of art, in the fashion of art and this is important for the audience and from that viewpoint and this is, a, I'm going to raise a question that where you probably are both agreed I'm very interested in the field of research that you have opened, not only regarding these tools that can create images, but also that can use methodologies from the artificial intelligence in order to create art history, which is quite controversial, because the way we create, we generate, the narrative of art is also very flawed. And I would like to connect this with a piece of work that Mario was making, um, which is a robot who is a critique, an art critique, and that can actually stand in a gallery and determine which is the most valuable piece of art, um, uh, probably uh, by comparing it with all the big data that it encompasses, that it has inside. And um, so adding all these ideas, putting them all together, can we really have a robot that is a good art historian or a good art critique uh, and in, to what extent the algorithms that we feed it with can affect this uh, the results well that's a very good question that yeah that's a project from from mario it's a project to create a robot that is able to create critics but as happens with this platform as harold was saying there's someone behind that is filtering that is showing uh, what is a piece of art to these platforms and he's fine-tuning uh, the tool until he considers that well when he has this this project ready it's able to make a critique about a piece of art and other platforms or other works that are Mario's that we've uh, been involved in one one is called Boto B-O-T-T-O -T -T -O, that it is a self-employed uh, artist and he is a decentralized artist so it's quite similar. Um, it's a platform that Mario is training that has been exposed to millions of images. This would, this would be impossible for a human being. Millions of inputs and they are creating, they are training what's art and what's not art until a platform can create pieces combining different styles from every kind of time and they're creating many many pieces and the same uh, platform rules out others because they consider that they couldn't be a piece of art and others are available for the community I'm saying that this is decentralized because the community votes the fragments as we call them that are considered as more artistic and these fragments are uh, go to an auction on the internet and as far as it is in the market is a piece of art but without this filter, without this human filter, the platforms wouldn't have this capacity of creating, the capacity of being an art critique. So, related to this, as Harold was saying, it's true that we can't see all the pieces of art that we have, all the pictures, all the videos, but it's true that this is what we do. I mean, every artist, every creator has references. Uh, we all have references. Uh, everybody who is writing, painting, um, taking pictures, we, uh, we all have references in our head. You combine them all together and you have an art artistic reference. And this is what uh, platforms do. Basically, they have access to these images and through their trainer or through their art they define what could be um, an, a piece of art but I insist that if we don't have this filter if we don't have this trainer that is the artist and is the one who defines I don't think that we can create a critique or a platform of a, of a self artist so to speak without without human contribution I would say so what is your opinion 
or how what are the lines that you're following in your research in order to apply these mechanisms or these new tools to uh, research in art history what is an art historian doing an art historian tries to write the history of art how do we how are we able to write the history of art we cannot fly back into time into hi history and look how those artworks were created all we can do we look can look at the objects um, that came into our present time via collections for example and so on, example and so on, so on today all those objects of art many of them in collections are being digitized and they are available to us uh, as open data for example mm. and we can gather a lot of collection data from all over the world and compare them for example so since the uh, data on those objects are digitally we can analyze them and that's more or less what we uh, do as digital art historians that is we actually apply um, uh, data science to art history so to speak why do we do that well at first because we're trying also to get on that level of big or bigger data we don't really have big data in that sense but bigger data in order to maybe not to have that bias that we usually have because if I in Munich go to my library I usually get uh, find books there about uh, European artists and I cannot have that wide uh, spectrum of information in that library so I am as a person are more biased more possibly as the the, the, the data set that I had available but there is no data that is unbiased we can never have that because we can never judge how biased or unbiased it is but the more data we have the possibility is higher that it's maybe less biased or at least if you look at uh, Wikidata for example it all depends on who is the creators of those data so we also need to create the data with the, that we then use to analyze but the idea behind that is that we can write art history in new ways and maybe tell stories that haven't been told before or ca get connections that I haven't we haven't seen before or tell the story of that very artist who has maybe not created that many um, um, artworks but is still worth telling uh, his the, the story because usually we have those number small number of of great artists and artworks that we keep on quoting but data science would give us possibly the opportunity to have other views onto the history of art other views on our culture and uh, in the end maybe get an, a little bit a different idea of who we have been and who we are today mm. but that is a path to walk we ha don't have the perfect results yet mm. we cannot tell whether um, our initial ideas will ever see the light of the day but we are trying out what we can do with the use of data and, 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 and algorithms in order to, our do, to, to do our job in at least different and maybe better way. Um, it's a sort of dream but at the same time the digital gap has a very strong impact because if we have this assessment database of that potential new art histories or a new narrative regarding art is based on collections or archives that are digitized um, so that this archives or collections or people who are not able to digitize their their uh, material they will be left outside so there is a risk when it comes to digital technology and there's a certain responsibility on the side of government so that we do not leave on the sides on the margins we are trying right now to bring in everything that we had left aside from the colonialism etc but now we are reaching a new stage in which we have to try not to leave anybody outside because of digitization so with big data will we the biases be uh, less strong or the bias will be based on those who are stronger and who can impose their ideas on the web exactly that's that's the task of today uh, let me tell you a quick um, a story we for seven years now we have a, an annual 
uh, summer school in Malaga. That's a corporation of uh, Berkeley, Malaga University and uh, the University of Munich. And we do a digital art history summer school there with students from Europe mostly, but during COVID, it was online and we had the possibility to have more students from actually all over the world. And I showed them Wikidata, for example, as a source for art history and I said, here you can search for your favorite artist, look for example, my, uh, my favorite artist, say Velasquez or whoever, and people from South America and India and so on, they entered their favorite artist and said, zero results. We have no data about our favorite artists, mm -hmm. of, of, the, of the artists in our countries that are so important to us. Because it also depends on who are those, in this case, mostly American collections that are able to uh, employ someone to bring their internal databases, for example, to Wikidata or, or other open data platforms. And of course, we will have a global uh, imbalance um, on the representation of what the history of art is, because some areas of the world are less able compared to others to have a representation of their culture in the digital space and that's of course a big issue. Mm -hmm. um, precisamente precisely in that sense and also connecting this with the question that I was asking uh, at the beginning you were talking Javier about the decentralization and obviously this is something that keeps on coming up, which is the um, ownership, the authorship, which is something that is something that we are leaving behind. Uh, we are questioning, we're challenging the single author idea and that uh, patriarchal idea of the issuance or the creation of art. But this is uh, the, the romantic idea of the genius artist is still there. It's very well rooted and it's true true, however, that we have uh, turned this authorship into something more liquid. We are reaching the idea of decentralization where the authoring is shared by a community uh, that uh, is in, on the internet, that is connected through the internet. And this idea of decentralized art, which I find is a very interesting idea, although it has certain dark aspects. To what extent a decentralized um, uh, community or art has good taste, bad taste, all these ideas re related to the big classic ideas of, of beauty. Um, we, the images that we have seen, we can all agree that they have certain a uh, new age tone and uh, some might be more um, evocative or more surprising but it is very difficult in my mind is to create certain imagery that is not only impactful or that that can actually reach the senses and uh, that an original thoughts by recovering ideas from the data. There's something that has to do with uh, the, the thinking, the philosophy, the critical thinking from the perspective of moving forward. And there's this idea that makes me wonder, um, can this be uh, damaged by the fact that we can be just content with what the machines can do. So what I mean is, where are the limits in our trust in the technological advances or where do you set these limits? Where do you think that we might find the wall that might um, compromise the positive view? I think you've introduced several reflections about authority because uh, technology moves faster than laws and now it's difficult uh, for the laws to to catch up basically but uh, speaking about authority there are topics like for example what happens if there's one just one person that is managing a platform Dali so 
uh, whose is this uh, piece of art? I think that there's only one case in the US where the, the author has been acknowledged, but almost always it has been rejected because behind of a, behind a piece of art that has to be a person, if there was a machine, you couldn't have the rights on this piece of art. This is one topic. Another topic is that it is a community that has an influence on how a, a piece evolves. In the Pottery example, it's true that there's a, commu a community that votes uh, what piece is the best, and that piece goes into an auction, an art auction through Super Red. It's a um, purchase uh, platform of NFTs, but they are giving opinions about pieces created by the platform, and this user's uh, opinion uh, has an influence on in terms of evo evolution. So the community, in some kind, is having an impact on how the platform is evolving from an artistic point of view, but it's not the author of the piece. So we move back to the paradigm who has created this piece of art. So if, n if it's not a human being, doesn't have rights. And all these pieces that are uploaded to the internet, well, they... Uh, belong to artists that passed long ago, but others are from new artists. So uh, how can they control the rights of these artists? Or how can these artists uh, reject or refuse to be in th on these databases? They are getting some of these pieces and they're creating new pieces. So there are many, a lot of discussion going uh, forward in terms of all three, in terms of if what, what is created with an AI platform is... Um, um, law that is abide by rights. So I think that this is going to be a long discussion and it has not been solved yet. Uh, in your view, this uh, research that are going on will be able to create an original thinking and divergent thinking, uh, critical thinking beyond the alternative art history or broader art history? <clears throat> First of all, I... Um you, we're asking about the limits of, of art and mm. technology and that relation to each other. Um, I would like to answer or say something to that at first. I believe artists um, have always had different roles and in part they've always also used technology in the broader sense. They've taken things apart and recombined them in ways that those, uh, those technologies that were not meant uh, for. For example, if you remember Namjoon Paik, who has used the television set, which was a new medium at his time in the 50s, and uh, took it apart and put it into and, and brought it into a new context and used it in a way that was, um, uh, was, was not intended for. So in, in, in short, Artists have always also been hackers in some way mm. because they were hacking technology, be it oil on canvas or whatever. And oil on canvas is the example that uh, the technology or the technique was developed by the artists themselves. What if you remember um, 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 Van Eyck, for example, who has been a master in the technique of oil painting and the oil painting was developed by artists themselves. So what I would like to see is that technology today is not coming from Silicon Valley or any kind of company like, like this one and we are just using the technology. I hope that um, art not, not only happens within or on that platforms, that, but that we have a kind of Silicon Valley of artists, that artists themselves create technology that wasn't there before. However, I see a tendency, for example, uh, OpenAI, that technology today often is that complex and takes so much data and consumes so much energy in terms of processing that you need to have a lot of capital that artists usually don't have, only companies like Microsoft and the infamous Elon Musk, uh, who are able to create such technologies. So then we are dependent from capital and, and big players in the field, and we can only work in the boundaries that they set for us. And I think that's, that's, that's a big, big, big risk that, uh, that I see. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm interested by this notion of all artists having hacked the technologies uh, and the techniques available, not only the, the media artists, uh, or, but also the 
alteration or a, a bad use even of a particular technology that could have opened a new experimentation uh, field or of new expression. Uh, I was thinking, for instance, in Julia Margaret Cameron, uh, who is, was a pioneer of uh, photography, who started working with color type uh, with a very difficult technique with a camera that had a small flaw defect, and uh, she couldn't handle it well. And this little defect made all her photographies uh, very uh, or somewhat blurred. But she was in this universe where photography was connected with pre-Raphaelites and uh, she wanted painting to be um, at the same level as photography or uh, to put them at the same level and so that glitch back uh, back then uh, turned into um, an artistic effect that was somewhat uh, replicating the sfumato effect of the uh, the renaissance artists so what started as a flaw uh, ended up being a uh, characteristic of the uh, trade of the artist now, the artist might uh, make a bad use of the media, sometimes in order to tell us about the limitations, the limits of the media, the constraints of the media, but also to tell us about our own constraints and the constraints of progress. And I wanted to bring about photography because we have heard it mentioned several times during our conversation. and. Um, I am in charge of a, a master's of, in photography and there is a student in this edition that has created a, um, a project that has been co-created with Dal E and um, I think she has picked a very interesting topic. She has taken a photography from the 19th century which was the first uh, creative photography in history by a photographer that has been mistreated by history and he didn't have access to the funds that he needed to develop his art. So he self-represented himself as a, a drowned person, as a person forgotten by history. And this was the first time that we find a self-portrait of a person that emulates the death of the artist himself. And it's uh, from very different reasons, a very interesting um, topic. And my student who is here uh, has decided to uh, enter the information related to the image into Dali and see what comes up and the result is very surprising from uh, uh, of all the years that I have been doing this masters um, the result I find it even more creative than anything that I have seen up to now uh, we have to make the difference obviously between the uh, the idea and the art the image and the imagination but uh, it's interesting to me that uh, photography that was also sort of scientific method that has been considered among the arts very late is is also in the ba at the base, uh, this idea is at the base of all these reflections because um, these media, these images are sort of digital images, digital photography, and th this might turn into change into something new in your collection. You have several uh, photographers who are creating uh, moving uh, images. So, w what would you say photography is right now with, with all these new technologies, or what artists uh, specific? Artists artists can you name that are using all the new possibilities within the realm of photography uh, when it comes to the digital side of it? Um, I'm sorry, I got, I've got lost with such a long question. Sorry, Maria. I was asking uh, in particular, what is photography like? Considering all the artists that you work with, uh, to what extent the digital technologies are entering the creative processes? Well, we should ask every artist, but uh, eventually they are tools. AI, uh, digital environments are tools that, I mean, the interesting things to see where they bring the artists to, what barriers they can, um, what boundaries they can explore with the artist and the audience. The, the artist needs someone to enjoy the piece of art. So it is where they want to take us to, how they explore the combination between picture with painting or uh, sculpture, what can they do, what can they create with these elements, it's in their heads, how can they use it, uh, how they're able able sorry to create them so how they can talk to the platforms there are new roles for example people that are able to talk to AI platforms 
to create interesting things, interesting projects. There are platforms that are selling prompts that Harold was speaking about. They have defined so good prompts that they sell them. They are very cheap, but you can buy a prompt because it defines a very interesting project. It's an interesting image, and that uh, entails a process. So I guess that it depends on how curious the artists are in order to explore, to play with these new platforms, with these new technologies, and to see where they take them to. That is the artist's role, as you were saying before, to experience. Um, I mean, to to. Yeah, to, to, to try things with paintings, sculpture, photography, or um, with uh, facilities or with the experience. And not only creating a painting, but also to create experience. Mm, maybe the, the trend is to create experiences that move the spectator, that make you feel something different. I think that's the role that the artists have to play. I said uh, earlier that I believe if a new artistic medium comes into the ecosystem of uh, of visual or artistic media um, the other medias change as well and we have seen that when photography came and how painting changed and i believe um, if um, uh, ai models uh, play a more important role in the future also photography as a formerly new medium will change how, do, how how does it change for example um Photography is often about creating an, or generating an image from the visual world. Fact is, we are looking at the visual world with two eyes, while the camera only has one eye. With the invention of photography in the 19th century, some early 19th century, it was black and white. So you, we have a three-dimensional impression of the world in color and in, in dynamics, and the uh, photo actually takes a very small fraction of that, re resembles like something like the real world, but actually black and white, static, and two-dimensional, like one-eyed. Um, and today, we uh, all have wonderful camera obscuras in here. I even have three here for some reasons. And we are walking around with cameras all the time. And we think what we get on screen somehow resembles what we have seen with our own eyes. In reality, there is already AI in all, all our phones. For example, it starts with HDR images. That is high dynamic range. That means with an analog photography, you had to um, choose which part of your image you want to have in good light. So it's too dark or too light, uh, maybe in other parts. With the photos you take now, actually the camera takes three or five or seven photos, and in each pixel it decides which has the best lighting. lightning. So you get a, an, an image that wouldn't be possible with analog photography, and you get an image that somehow looks more natural to our ways of seeing. And in addition, you always have a kind of filter um, uh, that uses neural networks in your, at least in this phone, uh, that improves your texture, for example, in photography and so on. So actually you receive an image that is already went through a process of data transformation. We call that computational photography that is already very far away from the kind of photography we probably grew up with. So AI is already there in photography. Mm -hmm. That is no answer to your question on its artistic um, results, but it shows that also already our impression of or of our idea of photography actually is has already changed more than we usually think mm -hmm. so to a certain extent we're living in a hyper realistic uh, world since all our memories are connected to these improved images these optimized images and not uh, the, the, the memories of uh, our, my January are tend to be in a sort of orangey tone and um, now we have this hyper realistic uh, idea which doesn't correspond doesn't match really with the world that we see and I'm very interested in the fact that we are making hyperboles of reality we are creating an imagery that is very seductive that can really be uh, shocking and uh, this is sometimes achieved through the super realistic idea yeah, but we are also living in a world, I mean, the, we have heard about metaverse, there are many people experiencing, maybe the, mo the youngest one are experiencing with a metaverse that they are not hyper real, they are uh, invented worlds, imaginary worlds, like we can see them uh, on the, in the cinema. 
I guess that there's a very wide range in photography, uh, cinema, etc., between the most and the least realistic imaginary worlds that we can enjoy. So it depends on the experience. It depends on what you're seeing or consuming then. Just to wrap this up, because I see that it's already quite late, and also invoking this capacity of moving us, which I think this is, uh, which I think is very specific, that reflects not only what we see when we are in front of uh, an artistic proposal or a piece of art or a work of art, but also the what we experience. I would like to you to tell me from your own experience some name, some artist or a recent reference that you might have about any works of art or visual proposal uh, generated with this type of technologies that have really moved you. Moved? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, 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 I, I'm a fan of two artists that I've already shown. One is Rafik Anadol and the other one is Mario Klingemann. Mm -hmm. I think if something's contemporary art in that area, then it's them. Mm. Um, but moved is uh, a difficult term. I am moved, if you want to call it this way, in the end of last year and early uh, this year, when a lot of people from all areas of the world came onto a platform and said, now we are all artists and we have the possibility to show our work before, and that has been the NFT platform. Mm -hmm. Because um, on that platform, of course, I, I don't like to speak about art so much. I call all of that digital visual culture. That is a much broader term. It's mm -hmm. about images and image generation. And if someone creates a, an image that is interesting to others, they are maybe even willing to pay for it. And if you want, you can call yourself an artist or an image creator. But that platform of NFTs uh, was also uh, promoted on social media and I've read and that was not only marketing that some people from South America for example said it's the first time I have access to a global audience and I can show myself and my work and uh, some of them could even make some money with it and someone wrote he had paid off the mortgage of his parents house and that was really true mm -hmm. Javier? What about you, Javier? Do you have any memory? Well, I can rem I can think of Mario Klingemann. I encourage you to to analyze him and to have a look at him. Um, in this world of uh, where we can access millions of images or images that have been created with AI, I think that art needs a context, a context where to enjoy a piece of art. And this overwhelming amount of pieces of art, I don't know if it's bringing to this experience. I mean, the experience of seeing a piece of art or enjoying a piece of art in a specific context, it doesn't matter whether it's, it's with AI, digital work, you name it. And other reflection is that we are used to uh, speaking about NFTs as a piece of art because there's uh, there has been a great noise in the media, but NFTs is not a piece of art per se. It is a vehicle, it is a tool to sell pieces of art. An NFT could be a picture, a video. Uh, I mean, it's a tool, but it doesn't mean that an NFT is a piece of art. And uh, there is a great amount of pieces of art, uh, uh, either they are art or not, maybe it depends on who is watching it. Some of them are could be collectible and others could be um, more similar to pieces of art. So there's um, super production of pieces, I would say, in the market that maybe will take us to be confused. What's a piece of art? What's not a piece of art? Who's an artist? Who's not? Um, I'm, I can't say this, but it's not an easy discussion, I would say. I would like to give some uh, time to the audience if they want to ask any questions, if they have any comments or they disagree with anything that they have heard here today. Sí, 
gracias por la ponencia. Eh, well, thanks for the talk. I would say, like in the chess world, uh, well, it has lost its splendor since Deep Blue uh, uh, won that uh, that uh, that mm, the game without Kaspar uh, with Kasparov. Maybe this could could this happen without? May maybe a machine could create something that a human being could do um, could this happen to uh, i mean with with chess play what has happened with chess players could happen with artists too well that's a very good question i think that there's a still a uh, chess world championship right and it has its audience well maybe there will be someone that could lose uh, the interest but um these stops come to my mind if journalists will disappear or photographers because cell phones uh, exist well everybody is still exist and i think that artists will exist um, it's true then the world of art is highly based on scarcity it wouldn't be the same if we had 10 million of very similar mona lisas there's just one but where will this super production take us to i think that artists will exist that f that's for sure a chess computer is uh, somewhat strange. I'm not familiar with today's chess computers, but I uh, understand how the classical chess computers work. It's just about computing power. Say they calculate every possible move and value each of that and then take the highest value and move that in that direction. And if you uh, calculate three or five or 15 future moves, and you can do that very quickly, the computer will always be the bit better player. At least the very e simple chess computers are always better than me. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but you can use a, um, a chess computer in order to, you can use a chess computer to compute very quickly chess moves, but that's nothing creative. You cannot compare that to the creation of images in general or art in particular. I believe, um, it could be that someone in the future we could uh, uh, do another step in artificial intelligence in something that even more looks like actual intelligence, but that needs not only computing power, it also needs um, um, a better understanding of the real world. I showed in my diagram that our current um, transformer models only are based on the on the images on the web while we are still uh, observing the real world who knows if that will one day also be taken uh, as a uh, as a source of data to such models but in the end we always when we are, whenever we talk about artificial intelligence we come to the point at which alan turing has been already in the i believe 1950s he said if there's one room in which a human answers your question in the other room is a computer or any kind of machine that answers your questions and you cannot tell which is which then it is intelligence because both appear intelligent and in turn you could ask what then is intelligence on creativity in humans maybe we are also only very complex biological machines so then you cannot tell which is which anymore of course, computers are some that particular kind of electronic hardware where software to, uh, runs on that is a different kind of system that are than our biological system. But in the end, maybe both will appear intelligent or creative or you name it, and we cannot tell the difference anymore. And then we are at the, at the point of, of, uh, of um, how it's called, singularity. Uh, where the machines take over, but actually, I think, not in our lifetime. Mm. Um, the uncanny valley, you mean? Just to add up something, I think you remember that DALI has uh, one million and a half of users that are using the platform. Maybe they are all training the platform. And uh, maybe the consensus of 1.5 million people brings us to so uh, such a common field that they are not interesting pieces of art anymore. I think that artists try to take us beyond our boundaries. If there are 1.5 million people uh, logging into a platform, they will do something similar. And maybe it, this could take us to a, to a very common field. We have to diversify the platforms. I think there was a raised hand over there. 
Ah, disculpa, sí, sí, perdona, sí. es que no estaba, perdona. <risa> eh, primero, felicito. First of all, I would like to congratulate you for this talk and this debate. I had a question for Harald. Um, first of all, I would like to ask him about the epistemology and creativity in human beings, because from my viewpoint, at least, um, I believe that there is a creativity that we do not talk about, and it is a realm that we could explore from an artistic viewpoint, which is the creativity of nature itself when it comes to creating phenomena or a wonder if biology and the spontaneity given by physics or that comes out of physics could be considered something creative and to what extent this moves uh, aside or makes our, our idea change regarding what is human and also um, when data that are not only information and this is especially aimed at Harald with his new project uh, and using data as a history uh, Historograph historiographic tool and when we are creating prompts when we want to bring things to light how can we correlate this data or how can this data correlate in order to generate new things and generate a certain openness when which is where I think there might be a difference between them and the human beings so how all that when it comes to the generation an idea or a content that goes beyond production because I understand by this debate that the production of images is not the same as the production of image of art both because of the uh, ecosystem that surrounds it and for many other aspects that are required for it to be called a uh, a work of art and so to what extent would you say that we are creating connections among data but how can we create information based on a database that as you said is biased in the sense that if the history of art is a biased history with capital uh, letters about the European cultural uh, history, what does this mean to modern art and modern art history of art? And could there be a linear narrative that really feeds on our own history? How can we turn this data into information? And I'm sorry, I, I went, uh, my question was too long, sorry. Um, first of all, there is no unbiased data. Data is always biased, as far as I can tell. And so it's always a difficulty here. Uh, how do we find out how biased it is in order to tell our stories upon those data? It's difficult. And with my students, uh, where I teach them uh, data analysis, we always um, say we can only uh, um, get results on the on the basis of the data that we actually have. We can sometimes find out where there are blank spots, where are the gaps, and, but we can hardly say how biased a data set is, only if we can compare it to another one and so on. So we, can al we always have to kind of live with it and have our maybe our own intuition um, to, to um, balance that. So that's um, a difficulty, of course, but it, we have always used Un, uh, um, biased uh, information. If you only go to your own library, as I said, that's also kind of biased. So we have to kind of live with it, I believe. Um, but I think uh, in your in the first half of what you said, um, you ask um, a different question about what art itself could be um, in 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 the digital age. And I would like to just quickly mention uh, two uh, things. I, I, I spoke about Plato. And Plato had a very distinct idea of what an image creator should do. That is only mimicking the visual world. For him, someone who, who paints a trompe l'oeil, for example, would be a great artist because it looks as if it's real reality. And photography would be perfect to the idea of, of, of an image at Plato. 
But the philosopher Aristotle had a totally different idea of what art and uh, poetry and so on should show. While Plato wanted to show what is or how things appear, Aristotle said uh, poetry can show how things could be or should be. And that is a little bit um, the distinction between what I said is um, interpolation of existing data and an extrapolation, if you want to call it this way, or, a, or an invention of new things that maybe only humans can actually do and the computer can only mimic. And I also mentioned um, Joshua Reynolds, who, who followed John Locke in the idea that everything in our brain is only a recombination of central data. And at the same time, William Bre Blake um, uh, made some comments on the discourses of Reynolds, and he totally disagreed. He said, no, uh, actual creativity, he did call it creativity, actual making of art, happens in the process of actual painting. So it's a process that happens in the, in the painting. And that comes close to what I mentioned in with the symbolic forms of Ernst Cassira, that we are able to create something actual, new and meaningful. And that's maybe something very human. Set aside what I answered to you, that the computer can maybe one day um, simulate that, that appears as if, but so far uh, that has not taken place, I believe. And so far there is still a distinction between what we are actually at least able, potentially able to do and, and what we should strive for as human beings and as artists to go beyond what actually is and to create something, something new, maybe that's very modernistic, mm. but uh, I believe um, we can also find that in the history of art for at least uh, the last centuries. Mm. Do you have time for a last question? Hello, well my question was about um, what you said about intellectual property of all these pieces of art. In the end, we've been talking about the fact that these pieces of art are generated by AIs by neural networks and so on, but up to what extent these AIs shouldn't be considered as means, like for example someone that has a great literary capacity of writing down what he is imagining in his head, but not that technical capacity of executing it, up to what extent AI should be considered a tool to make what he has in his head into an image and on the other hand, on the other side, combined with her training, etc., and images with copyright uh, to train these uh, AIs, etc. Up to some extent, these uh, artists take these references. So up to some extent, they inspire, they drink, and they learn from these uh, art references that have uh, intellectual property and they are not criticized, but it is considered an evolution. So up to what extent wouldn't be something similar in terms of training AI with these uh, kind, with this kind of um, pieces of art. Yeah, I agree with you. Deep, uh, deeply, every artist drinks from its environment, from his environment, from his own role models, his favorite artists, and this, this has an impact on the way they create. The difference in terms of uh, some uh, some artists can have the right of saying, "Hey, don't use my images because." Sometimes they admit uh, a part of something that has been created by AI. I mean, they recognize part of their uh, brushes or part of a signature of an artist. So maybe it is um, it's a it's a it's a legal issue. I would say up to what extent you have the right of uh, not allowing the others to use your images to create others. And regarding the authorship, it is a legal issue. I think that uh, technology arrives very early and uh, systems have to get adapted. Right now, I think that there have been many requests that uh, want to have rights on pieces that have been created by AI. And up to now, with the exception of one artist, uh, they free they have refused to give legal rights because this piece had been created by the by the platform. The prompt had been created by a person, but the output was created by a platform, so it was not a human being. It had no rights. It is something that has to change. But uh, this is the current situation. But we are at the very beginning, so I'm sure that there will be legal changes and market changes. I'm sure.
for digital art called Deviant Art. Um, they, uh, if, if you upload your uh, your your artworks at Deviant Art, you need to opt out. You had to opt out uh, whether your images can be used for um, artificial intelligence purposes. And they've changed that now because a lot of artists. Uh, deleted their op part of such models. And there's also been one story, I think in the New York Times, where one artist um, found that his distinctive and particular style he could replicate with Delhi um, because it was based on also his images. And he thought, so I'm kind of a co-creator, how do I get paid or can I be pulled from that model? And by the way, technically, that's almost impossible to take certain image, uh, images out of that model because they are abstracted there. If you want to take them out of that model, you have to train that model uh, again right from the start, and that's a lot of work. So these are the things that um, are interesting at first. How does that co-creation takes place from this, this huge amount of images, from huge amounts of, uh, of, 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 of people, of creators, um, and the one who then enters the prompt and bases his own image on on, on those um, objects from those creators. And these are the, the issues that we haven't solved yet, mm -hmm. but that we see as stories online and um, need to adapt on them or at least um, make use of that particular um, particular properties of that tool. Mm -hmm. Bueno, well, I think we could be chatting forever uh, on such an interesting topic. I was saying that uh, answers were not going to be given today. There are so many open questions from the legal viewpoint, from the ethical point of view. and. Uh, also with regards to what is the function of creativity but I wanted the right questions to be asked and some of them you have given us and um, it's funny to think that they're all uh, dealing with the human side of creation we are talking about uh, creativity as a biological or organic impulse and in a debate about the future of art in the digital area, we are discussing if we are more uh, team Plato or team Aristotle. And with that, you you have to choose uh, this, uh, which is your team. And this is the basis from for any creative act. And uh, with that last note, I would just want to thank Harald for sharing his knowledge about this universe with us and also to have started some internal uh, controversies and also thank you to Javier for all his knowledge about this realm, this field, because I think it's very important that this art that has, uh, that is in our households through the screens finds um, it's space when uh, new experiences that go beyond the, ha the screens are shown and probably museums need to facilitate the access to these pieces, uh, to these works of art uh, beyond the screens. And thank you everyone. Uh, it's a bit late, but I think the topic really deserved a longer chat. So thank you everyone and see you next time. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to be here. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank Thanks. you so much.